Robert and Marco Arts, and we run the office of Harma Architect. And I want to apologize already at the start for our English and for all the imprecisions and the nuances we will probably be missing, but we will try to be understandable. During the talk, we will swap and Marco will start. Yeah. So we, uh, we will talk about a project that's part of a new urban extension of Antwerp, which is connected to the so-called Zuid, the South. Um, the South, or in this case, the Old South, is part of the 19th century urban extensions of the city. Uh, and it's seen here in the white dot. And the Old South is a typical 19th century, but rather formal urban plan consisting of closed building blocks, which are made with separate houses. This area is now extended again with an urban quarter called the New South or New Zuid. Um, this part uh, used to be a large industrial railway site before the Antwerp docks were relocated to the north side of the city with the tracks almost perpendicular to the river Schelde. Uh, and out of a competition came a master plan by Seki Vigano who did not take up the well-loved closed block structure of the old South, nor did they suggest a completely open modernist structure. So the plan, as you can see here, is, is something in between. It's a configuration of buildings in the form of characters, really an I and L, O and U, that take up the direction of the former railway tracks. And these character configurations create relatively open spatial relations, which vaguely recall the urban vocabulary of the old town. So there are streets, alleys, and squares and gardens, but often they make for ambiguous relations uh, between house and the public space. So everything in the urban plan is numbered. Our project is block 18, which is seen here in, uh, in black, uh, and it's situated in the third so-called Striga. Uh, Stri Striga is comprised of two strips of buildings divided by a street on one side and a pedestrian path with the green borders on the other side. The plot borders uh, the southeastern park side in a strip made entirely of the character I. And it's a, a relatively small project in the entire master plan, but has a really nice and quiet location with views all around and a, and a real strong relation with the southern uh, park. So we will explain our way of working through three principles. The first one's type, it's related to form and place. The second is mass or gravity. And the third decorum related to an idea of construction linked to the architectural language. So the first one type, like I said, the master plan consists of only characters. So type here was not an a priori condition. It's a formal structure that evolved out of a struggle with form and utility. The latter being in this case, the building laws. Um, so understanding New South as an extension of Old South, the, um, the idea of parcellation was something we felt as a necessity because the, the new urban structures is so very different. We wanted to make a relation on the level of the building blocks. Like I said, in the Old South, the blocks consist of, uh, of different houses and New South block and house are very often not the same thing. So to give scale to a very large house or relatively large house, we worked with the idea of a differentiated whole. And this idea developed during the early design stages when we were studying the building laws prescribed in the master plan. So the first one, the laws allow for offices to be 20 meter deep and apartments only 14 meters. In the master plan, the building was supposed to house offices, but our client Triple Living wanted a mixed use building with apartments uh, above ground floor offices. We liked this idea a lot. However, um, when left untranslated, this would have resulted in an unbalanced building volume, especially with a series of three meter deep winter gardens that was, to be, that was supposed to be added to the volume but only at the site directed towards a wide open view, which the master plan called the panorama. And the panorama was indicated to be at the east and south side only. So another imbalance. 
On top of all this, each Striga has a limit in terms of brutto square meters, and Block 18 was the last building in the Striga, so we had to work with the square meters that were left. Gallery Tim van Laar had just been designed and took up more square meters than originally intended. Uh, so we ended up really with a leftover brutal surface that would make for four floors only. Uh, at that point, we were really unhappy with what the master plan directed here. So what we did is we shortened the building and made it one floor higher. So an open square and thereby a view on the north side appeared. And this made it possible to have a third panorama site that would balance the one on the south side. With offices on the ground floor, the necessary base of 20 meter was provided, but the 20 meter, 14 meter difference still gave the building an explicit direction and an unbalanced appearance. So we now use the three panorama sites to, um, to make three building volumes and rotated them towards their own panorama, the heads being 14 meter deep and 20 meter wide, which solved the difference and balanced the volume. And finally, we push these winter gardens into the volume. So the hole finds its center and the form closes. At the west side, oddly enough, because there's no panorama there, we were only allowed a balcony of 1 meter 25, which qualifies this side as something of a backside, really. And, um, and in the end, the studies resulted in some interesting advantages, we thought. By making the building shorter, we now needed only two staircases instead of three. And of course, making it shorter and higher was beneficial for the proportions, which was the underlying motivation to begin with. Um, and by adding the west side balcony, an open air connection between the staircases was made, which allows us uh, to dismiss the escape ladders the Antwerp Fire Department requires in situation with singular staircases. So, the struggle of form versus utility eventually worked for the rationality of the building, even though one always starts out feeling these conflict limit the design process. Uh, in a way, one can say that instead of a slab, which is a geometry only, not a building type, we made a building that consists out of three parts, each having distinct proportion properties of a palazzo the symmetry, the regular openings, the tripartition with the base and the corners, a representative quality of the facade achieved here by the multi-story loggia, which was our translation of the winter gardens. At the same time, one can understand the building as a whole with a partition. This double readability of the building is interesting, I think. There's always something uh, unfinished about it with different possibilities of interpreting the building. And we have, in fact, three loggia, which make three faces or three facades towards an important public space. In an urban plan with such few hierarchies, the idea of multiple faces was relevant, we found, in order to properly address the different open spaces. So every, every step in the design process was made to give this relatively small building on this location in the master plan the necessary amount of authority. And the fourth facade seen on the left here is, uh, is quite unintentionally uh, developed into perhaps the most interesting one because there's so much happening. Volume-wise, there's a comparable principle that Baldessare Peruzzi used for the Villa Farnesina in Rome, where the front facade is rather restrained and the garden facade becomes more interesting by the recess of the middle part and the adding of a loggia. In our case, the form developed by working with the restrictions of building depth. The lodge is three meter, the building mass 14 meter, the balcon balconies only one meter 25. This balcony, articulated as a shallow loggia to continue the motif, creates the effect of different spatial layers, which is added to by the stairs that work their way through the building mass towards the roof. So while working with the typological reference of a palazzo as a multi-story house with a public base, there's also an element that finds its reference in a very specific form of palazzo found in Naples, namely the open staircase at a backside, which in Naples is the courtyard side. This often very sculptural open staircase gives the backside something quite representational. And this is what happens in block 18 too. 
The position of these winding staircases is directly related to the entrances. And the nice thing with these stairs is that they're not just a functional circulation space, but they have a theatrical quality where a person moving through the building appears, disappears, and so on. A little bit like a scene of Jacques Tati's movie, Mon Oncle, where Tati's old house is penetrated by a very complex system of balconies and stairs at which the neighbors meet as some sort of romantic remnants of the pleasures of urban life. The plan underlying the type develops with the logic of building mass, construction, and facade. The, the plan, as we see here, uh, has been designed from the start with the possibilities of different kinds of use and dwelling sizes in mind. So we have minimized the load bearing walls inside the building and have been concentrating on the design of sensible facades and circulation cores to have a structure which is as flexible as possible. Because what's certain is that program can and often will change in the lifetime of a building. It changed a couple of times already during pre-design and then again when the apartments were sold. So what you see in this plan in terms of apartment divisions is only an illustration of the possibility of the structure. Also, the ground floor will not house the intended offices like shown in the drawing, but will be housing a boxing club. And there's also going to be a juice bar, which is nice, and will face the green square uh, we've created on the north side, seen here on the left. The bar will use the ground floor loggia as covered terrace and a transition space. So in every different way, the flexible structure is inhabited. The base re re retains its, um, its public character. The section here shows from left to right the layer, layering of the three meter loggia, the 14 meter building mass, and the shallow loggia of a meter 25 with the connection, uh, connecting staircases. But also the relation between the ground floor and the street and at the other side, at the right, the entrances to the apartments along the path and the wadi. So it's, it's necessary to, uh, to realize that an apartment building can never be a Gesamtkunstwerk with every interior detail designed. It's an urban artifact that should have a character which develops when working with type, construction and decorum, but internally things must be possible. All that's in our, the architect's hands, so to say, is the urban form, the structure, the circulation spaces, and the facade. About the importance of history. Uh, the citation here by Giorgio Garcia is translated, architecture is the architectures. And what it means is, that all the knowledge of architecture is contained within the realized works, works that belong for the largest part to history. So if you understand history this way, the borders between past and present vanish, between architects dead or alive, they all have a simultaneous presence. So for us, um, they are in fact important company when we work every time, we run into a design problem. Uh, we ask ourselves, how would uh, so-and-so have solved this? For example, the corner, a wall system with openings, window openings on the long sides flanks, interacting with a pillar and beam or an architrave system on the short sides. A very complicated meeting uh, we found, especially at the top floor level, Andrea Palladio must have run into a similar problem with the corner of the Palazzo Chiricciati in Vicenza. Uh, the Palazzo has three bays with a central bay slightly protecting. The loggia also is the leading motive and the side bays even have a multi-story loggia. And it's there that the astonishing solution is introduced. Uh, so the first issue, uh, like I said, was the corner. If you look at Palladio's Palazzo, it becomes clear. You cannot have two distinctly different systems meet in a point zero. So the last bay is there to separate and at the same time connect one system with the other. The column in Palladio's case is placed against the wall to finish the architrave system 
And at almost the same moment, the wall system begins. An analogy to this, uh, but simplified, we use the last bay of the facade to translate one system into the next while completing each system in itself. Um, Palladio also used a larger window, window opening to articulate the side bay of the loggia, uh, which we again in a simplified manner adopted by way of adding the first opening at the side bay of the loggia to the series of window openings. So this larger opening belongs to both systems. The second issue occurred between the central bay and the side bays, a wall system and a column and beam system or a pillar and beam system. The, in our case, the columns are hiding in the wall. Anyhow, two different systems that cannot meet on a flush surface. So distinguish between the pillars and the wall, they are of the same material after all, the middle bay is pushed out a few centimeters to give the central loggia, um, to make the central loggia readable as a completed system. The central part was also used to solve, and in this case, self-inflicted issue um, to avoid an inappropriately grand gesture. We lowered the central loggia part just a tiny bit. This way, the more massive side bays become stronger corner moments, something we found that Palladio had also experimented with, for example, in the Villa Tresino. To accentuate this movement, we added a small concrete parapet, which in the middle bay is retreating backwards, and it is getting small pedestals on which statues could be standing. We have been joking with our client about whose statues could be added, but haven't picked up on that yet. Maybe the hardest thing when designing a building is to find the right style for the job. This is about searching what is appropriate for a specific project, not what is absolutely right because there's no such thing, although there are things that are absolutely wrong. Uh, a good start when searching for a style or manner is the idea of construction, which has been, of course, the basis of classical architecture. But therefore, it is possible, but not always necessary, to use the classical elements in their full formation. With this project here, we didn't think it was necessary nor appropriate. Instead, we use the idea of construction to make the elements in terms of order and materiality understandable. For example, the cross beams resting on the architrave as the main beam or on the lintels here, which again are resting on the pillars down to the plinth that forms the fundament for the pillars. Um, let me just say this, we are not pretending to be specialists in classical architecture. Everyone who is will attest we are not. But we are trying to find with these studies principles that we can use to limit the infinity of choices and to have a rational basis for the things we do. A classical fundament, uh, I think, is rarely taught at universities. Most architects, I believe, had to uncover these fundaments uh, by themselves. I'm thinking of very different living architects like uh, Bob van Reet in Belgium, Hans Koloff, obviously, uh, or Peter Merkley, who gave several great lectures on this channel, showing his labor studies into questions of language, proportions, and so on. So it's a process. And of course, we're only at the beginning of it. Regarding the core. The logic of construction not only helps finding a language, it also helps to build logically, which also means economically. So we try to think of a building from the ground up with elements that are needed anyhow to hold the building together, keep the water out and so on. Um, I said jokingly that the columns are hiding in the wall. And of course, 
I'm hinting to Leon Battista Berti, who writes that the essential elements involved in a facade are the roof, the wall, and the opening, not the column, oddly, which for him is part of the wall. It is hiding on the wall, but when it appears, it's the sublimation of the wall, most suitable for grand monuments of architecture. Block 18 is not a public building, but a modest residential building. So the columns here remain in the wall. We worked uh, in fact with the facades in such a way that the wall system and the pillar and beam system become recognizable, but even in the latter and the pillar and beam system, the wall is never completely gone. Um, there is a sense of enclosure in this lodge which would be weakened, would we have used uh, cylindrical columns, for instance, even in a larger number. And this sense of enclosure is important to create discrete urban outside spaces for the apartments. So the wall is what defines space, but material-wise, it's also what binds the three parts of the building together. This also goes for the concrete parts, uh, of course, the lintels, uh, cornerstones, uh, and so on that articulate load bearing. They articulate, uh, in fact, what is necessary to make openings in the wall and to give uh, a building also visual stability. Uh, when we do this, we try not to invent anything but we try to use the logic of traditional construction techniques. Domans von der Laan uh, was a Benedict monk and architect who worked not far from here. Uh, and in fact, the whole of the Bosse school are examples that we studied for this project. How to make something that is not overly refined, but rather elementary, using construction elements as the actual facade elements. Um, we've talked a lot about the material side now, the matter, but there is another side also, proportion. If the material is the visible, the concrete side, proportion is the invisible and the abstract side of design. Of course, the material, like the bricks, have a specific measure but there are many measures possible for, let's say, an opening. And further, this opening may be related to other openings, which in turn may be related to a part or whole of a facade. So to make an order, there has to be a relation between these elements and scales, a common rule, we think. Um, this rule may or may not be always perceivable, but we believe it always is, even unconsciously. But as a tool in the design, it can be extremely helpful. It makes space and matter countable and therefore relatable. Peter Mackley also spoke of visual stability in his lecture, proportions that the proportions can give. But most importantly, perhaps, proportions are prime territory for architects. All other disciplines are busy with sizes, not with proportions. August Tiersch was one of the first to point out the rule of similarity. Um, this rule can be seen here in a drawing he made of a facade fragment of the Villa Farnesina. And of course, there can be tolerances related to what the eye can perceive. So it's not an exact science. When we studied the dimensions of everything, we worked both with ratios that give well suitable proportions to the elements and with similarities that direct the relations between them. And there are several reoccurring ratios in the front facade, for example, such as three by four or eight by nine in the elements uh, as well in their relations. What goes for the surface also goes for the spaces, of course. Um, for example, the larger spaces in the middle part are almost one by one a square. The larger at the ground floor and the upper floor are three by five, which is a whole number ratio, but also an approximation of the golden section. So 
these ratios or proportions are a tool, like I said, not an aim. The aim lies in the perception of, in this case, a space that relates to a person who should be able to understand the space, both physically and uh, intellectually. When uh, building is the final goal, the perhaps last universal principle architecture has to adhere to, even in denying it, is gravity. Philosopher, uh, philosophers such as Arthur Schopenhauer have linked mass to aesthetical perception. In short, art is the materialization of laws and ideas. For every art, a different idea is relevant. For the art of building, the single most important idea is gravity, which is best expressed through great masses. So the idea is something unrelated to place, uh, place and time, and the expression is what becomes of this idea when confronted with place and time, to be concrete with matter or materiality. So to express massiveness, one needs materiality, and we've tried to use the material to express gravity. Um, everything relates here. Gravity, material, construction, decorum, and another term, tectonics. Um, the importance of tectonics, we think, lies in it relating to the idea of construction uh, to its architectural articulation. Uh, Karl Börtecher described tectonics as the art form, the fine architectural parts expressing the work form, which are the statically necessary parts without uh, both being identical. The same phenomenon is described by Antonio Monasteroli as technical forms that need to be translated into architectural forms to become understandable. Um, so there's a relation, but it's never literal. We are not interested in showing technicalities, of course, but we try to use the elements of construction to translate them into elements of architecture. Um, this means that the structurally necessary sometimes needs to be dressed or translated into something that is also understandable, like the supports here, which are the technical form being translated into pillars, which are the architectural form. At other times, the relation can be more direct and the structurally necessary only needs articulation as something that is also architecturally necessary, like the lintels or the terraces here, the workers' lintels uh, 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 do. So the subject uh, of dressing uh, is also something that Adolf Lewis uh, has written about uh, in the essay, Why a Man or a Woman for that matter should be well dressed and it's about appropriate behavior in the public space that is. Uh, but let's look at some details uh, that we found to be tectonically important. There are two systems, as I said, a wall system with openings and a pillar and beam uh, system. Uh, these systems are divided volumetrically, but connected material-wise here with coping stones. Around the corners, um, the parts intertwine, giving the corner extra stability. There is an important, slightly protruding uh, detail at the ground floor translated into brickwork, which can be understood as an abstraction of what in a classical building would have been the head of a major cross beam. The same motif appears up there in the architrave, the main beam, now in concrete and for matters of relief, slightly recessed. 
the cornice then gets this very important shadow, which sits deeper than the slider shadows at the side base. Above each opening in the outer facade, a concrete lintel or a standing bond prevents the brick mass from falling down uh, physically and also visually. Uh, the deep window reveals and flush window cells, cells help to enhance the idea of mass. These window cells can be flush thanks to the little spouts that are made from brass, which carry the water off the wall, which is quite an old fashioned detail. The thing is, all these details can bring something essential to the building. And it's important to see more detail when you come closer, so it's not like a scale model. The articulation of these smaller cross beams that rest on the main beam is a basic principle in classical architecture, which is still visible here as an imprint in the concrete elements of the loggia ceilings. Perhaps not surprising, uh, when construction started, dismissing of this relief was the first proposal for price reduction, which we uh, couldn't agree with, obviously, because it is very visible from the street and it gives character to all the loggia, in fact, the whole building. So even though we always try to work with builders to find better ways of doing things, um, this wasn't one of them. To round up this chapter, there is a German term to describe the recognizability of, for example, an architectural element, namely Anschaulichkeit. It means that something is readable or comprehensible through the eye first, then the mind. So by means of Anschaulichkeit, each architectural element can explain its identity and its role within the building. So which element is bearing which, how all the forces come to the ground, providing a feeling of um, perhaps familiarity. We think this is important for architecture to be readable and to be understandable. It's the most static of all arts, the slowest, uh, the most dependent on place and matter, and certainly the most public. So the last chapter is about the material. Um, we have tried to source the materials locally, the bricks, the uh, glazed bricks, the tinted concrete, the wooden windows and the ironwork, they all come from places not much farther away than 100 miles. And um, the Van der Mortel bricks, for instance, are made just down the river. Uh, we use rather long and thin bricks and combine two series, one that's green and one that is gray and sometimes a bit burnt, which is, burned, which is, uh, which is uh, especially beautiful, we think. Um, and we had them uh, placed with very thick and flat brush joints to uh, articulate the massiveness of the brickwork. It's, um, and it's a wild bond, again, adding to the massiveness. Except for the upright course above the wall openings and below the, uh, below the cornice. The bricks are rough and so are the joints, which, uh, which felt right for the location, the most natural part of the master plan at the edge of the park. Uh, as a secondary material, we've used the prefabricated um, concrete for lintels and cornices, and cornerstones and window sills. And we had the manufacturer, the Yom, had a very subtle green pigment uh, that's pretty similar to the basic concrete shade. It's just adding an idea of color that goes well with the tone of the bricks. So uh, the concrete was then polished, uh, which results in a more precise shape of the elements and the smoothness of the polished surface separates it from the brickwork when the sun shines on it. Um, so with an outside that rough and elementary, we wanted the inner layer of the facade to be shiny and more precious looking. And glazing bricks is a completely different business. So for this, we worked with another specialist in Dior's, and they use a transparent green glazing on a rough surfaced water struck brick. This combination creates 
a richness in shade, uh, a richness in shade, and, and shows something of the of the the roughness of the brick beneath. The glazed bricks were used in the loggia and in the entrances, uh, so places where one can actually touch uh, the surface. So we wanted the more intensely colored gla glazed bricks and the metallic green ironwork to enhance the green in the rough of brickwork and the concrete, especially where the, the glazing rub runs up to the ceiling, like in, in the loggia here. They create a, a colored reflection in the loggia. It's an, a sort of indirect and uh, broken light, which is rather homely and, and adds to what we actually intended uh, to give that loggia an interior character with a preciousness that comes from the material, um, a bit like uh, like the loggia in the Villa Farnesina, with, uh, which is frescoes by Raphael, of course. Our version in the end is obviously not quite as precious, um, but also the entrances are finished in the same glazed bricks. And uh, they are in fact the most public of all the interior spaces. And, and they represent the house as a whole. So that we wanted to work with the glazed bricks for the floor and the wall finishing but the glazed bricks for the walls were not resistant enough to be worked on. So St. Joris developed with us specifically for the project, a very durable glazing, which we used for the flooring of the entrance halls, as you can see here. Uh, the floor tiles are placed in a pattern that give, gives direction and measure to the spaces. It's, uh, it's sort of a parquet bond that, that gives the space uh, a very residential and interior quality. Um, above the ground floor mat, uh, it's not here yet, but uh, there's a round skylight that lets in the zenithal light and, and gives some gravity to the space. So the common spaces uh, were, were really important to us, the materialization of them. Uh, the entrances, um, the hallways, the staircases, and, and of course, uh, the roof garden where the round element is returning in the form of a step. So the roof, roof garden has a long wooden walkway or a table as uh, our garden architect calls it. Inhabitants can enjoy views uh, from uh, this elevated wooden walkway, um, uh, which also uh, works as a cover for all the techniques that normally end up at the roof, at the roof level. So there's nothing of that kind there. Sitting or lying down, it's, um, it's a sheltered space enhanced by plants that sh still have to grow into a, into a dense and coast inspired garden. The pine trees, shrubs and, and grasses that can resist harsh, uh, harsh sunlight and winds that come down from the towers and across from the river. So talking about the common spaces, we should of course not forget the basement because when people come home in their automobiles, this is the entrance door. Um, and it should welcome them home like a street side entrance does. Only in a basement, not much is needed to express a different status really with uh, everything is in concrete there. So, which is why we confine ourselves to the use of a more humble, but still clearly um, readable means of representation, which is a dark green door and a wooden door frame and lacquer at wainscot's height. So lots of the things then find their way into the building, of course, like all the stuff the fire department's adding in the basement where nothing much is happening. These fire extinguishers, uh, funny enough, have almost a story of their own. So finally arriving at the basement, um, not much more can be said really, except perhaps the most important thing is that one needs to be lucky to have a client and a builder, in fact, a whole team involved in the process, uh, people that are critical enough to improve what can be and have trust enough in the design. And, and we think we have been really very lucky this way. So many thanks for listening, everyone. And many thanks again, Alice, uh, Alice Woodman, for the kind invitation. And perhaps we see you in Antwerp someday. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. At Brickworks van der Mortel, we make high-quality bricks, slips and clay pavers in unique colors and sizes. To support architects around Europe and the UK, 
we created a brand new high-end brick lab, housing the latest in ceramic innovations. Built on more than 150 years of experience, we bring together tradition with the architecture of tomorrow. Every brick, slip and clay paver in our brick lab is part of a research and development program creating new knowledge and insights. Working together with architects, we can thus reach higher levels of sustainability, quality and circular solutions, combining them with the highest design standards of today. All this without losing our passion that we would love to share with you.